you search me? How you know me? You pursue my every thought from afar. God, how far down? How far down do I need to go? 
My soul is at rock bottom. I know what I did. And the worst part, I knew what I was doing. And I still did it anyway. I won't pretend. I won't make excuses. I have left a trail of tears and pain behind me. They didn't deserve it, God. It was my fault. The shrapnel from my explosion shouldn't hurt them. I've wronged you, God. I've taken the trust you put in me. I've taken the love you gave to me and threw it all away like it meant nothing to me. I'm sorry, God. Your love is everything to me. And yet all I feel is empty. Please, God, don't take your presence away. Pick me up from this muddy pit that I dug and drop me into a pool of clean water. I need this dirt washed from me. I need to swim from the bottom and break through to the surface. A new person. I want to be new, God. I will leave my baggage at the bottom. You can give me a new start. I will be a servant of the living God.
Hey, Word Life Church. I have been looking forward to this service for years. We've been planning an Ash Wednesday service for uh, for a few years, and it just seems like something keeps happening. And what do you know? Something's happening. This big, you know, snowstorm coming. I'm, I and I, but I really wanted to get together for Ash Wednesday, and so we've got some some music available, you know, so for us to worship together. I really wish that we were worshiping in person together at uh, at the Lasur campus, but but this is what we got for today, and so um, I get to tell you that I have never led. An Ash Wednesday service. This is my first Ash Wednesday service ever, uh, and and I and it seems crazy. Of all of the you know the the Lenten seasons, of all the Lent services and all the Holy Weeks, uh, you know, and and all leading up to all of the Easter's that I've gotten to to lead for you know years and years, I've never led an Ash Wednesday service, and the reason is, I just didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't I didn't get the whole Ash Wednesday thing, you know, the 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 ashes on the forehead, the the you know, the number of churches that that stop, you know, singing alleluia, you know, for for all of Lent and the, you know, the giving up, you know, coke and chocolate or yeah, as if somehow that would like kind of like contribute to our holiness or something like that. It, it I just never got it. It didn't Ash Wednesday never seemed to really agree with our theology. We believe that forgiveness and salvation is by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it has nothing to do with what I've done in any way, shape, or form. No amount of giving up you know, something is going to earn me anything in God's eyes. And so what is a, a Lutheran understanding of Ash Wednesdays and how can we get together uh, today with a posture of repentance that wholly, completely depends on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that forgiveness is through Christ and him alone? How do we do it in such a way that we are confessional of our sins, but also confessing our faith to one another, trusting that God's got this? As we get together for, for Ash Wednesday, I was thinking about um, I was thinking about 1 John. And uh, we're going to be kicking off our whole entire Lent season. And throughout Lent, we're going to be talking about repentance. Repentance is this biblical term that literally means to turn toward God. Well, I mean, sometimes we can have this tendency to be like, you know, repentance means like, I'm sorry, but it's not really just an, I, an I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, God, but really it is a turning toward God to receive uh, what we can only receive from him. Grace, forgiveness, cleansing, washing clean of all of our sins as 
only possible through Jesus Christ. And so I was thinking about 1 John, and, and I, thought I'd, I thought I'd read a little bit to you. 1 John uh, was written by John the Apostle, and the same, same John who, who wrote uh, the, the Gospel of John, the same guy whose, uh, whose nickname for himself is the Beloved, the one whom Jesus loved. Same exact guy, and you can you can see, see those kind of like echoes. As a matter of fact, as we begin reading First uh, John, you might even start thinking a little bit about uh, the beginning of, of John's gospel uh, as he's talking about who Jesus is. And check this out. It's right in First John, starting in verse one, reading in Jesus' name because it's God's word, not mine. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Yeah, we're talking about Jesus. That's one of those terms that's used to refer to him is the word of life. Sound familiar? Word of life? Yeah. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life with which, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete." Just going to pause right there for a second. As the Apostle John kicks off in his letter to the church, you'll notice this is a little different than, than you know, than you know some of the letters to like specific lo churches in specific locations. John's writing to all believers, and that means he's got a message for us uh, as believers in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, "Look, I was there. We were there." We, we heard Jesus. We heard him speak. We saw him. We touched him with our own hands. We know exactly who he is. And it's his story, the word of life, Jesus Christ, the, the eternal life. It's his story that we're telling. And I just, it's so incredibly awesome. And, and by grace through faith, it's God who's inviting us into this relationship or this fellowship uh, together, not just as Word of Life Church, but also together with God the Father and with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're into, starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That means that there is no sin in God. God has never sinned. He never will. He never has. There is no sin in him. He doesn't make people sin. He doesn't cause sins to happen. He is light, completely pure, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, if we say that we have like a relationship with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Pause. Yes, that's right. If we say that we have a relationship with God, again, remember, that relationship is started by God. He's the one who gives us the faith to believe. He's the one who gives us grace. He's the one who starts this relationship, right? Right? If we say that we have fellowship with God, and if we say that we have fellowship with each other, we have this relationship that God started, and he, and he creates this relationship with us, and that gives us relationship with each other as believers in Jesus Christ, then, but if we walk in the darkness at the same time, if we're just living in sin at the same time, we're liars. We're not even practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, then we have a relationship with him and with each other, and the blood of Jesus Christ washes us completely clean from all of our sin. That's the kind of stuff. Walking in the light doesn't mean living a perfect life. I haven't gotten there yet. You haven't gotten there yet. Um, it just means living in the light that says, when God's light shines on us and we stand before God, and sometimes that means his law. 
and it reveals to us when we have sinned. Then we immediately go before God and the blood of Christ just washes us completely clean of all of our sin. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we, if we say that we, we don't have any sins, if we say that we're not struggling with sin, or if we say that, hey, I've gotten to a place where I'm so good I don't sin anymore. We're just lying to ourselves. And in the process, the truth of who God is and who we are, that's not in us. Verse 9, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, if we say we have no sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. But the opposite is confessing our sins. And if we confess our sins, it's God who's faithful. Remember, we've been talking about faithfulness for the last few weeks. It's God who is faithful, and he is just. That means that he is faithful, as in he keeps his promises. And so when he says he's going to forgive us, he really does forgive us. When he says he's going to give us his grace, he really does give us his grace. When he says he's going to give us faith to believe, he really does give us faith to believe. And, and, but he's also just. He is absolutely perfect. He is the embodiment of justice. He does it perfect every single time, which means he sees us perfectly. He is just. So he is both faithful and just, and he will forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us, wash us completely clean, not because of what we've done, but what, because of what Christ has done for us. It's his righteousness that is given to us and our unrighteousness that's washed away. In verse 10, it says, if we have not sinned, we, uh, if we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar because God is the one who's kind of pointing out to us, you know, through the power of his word that says, look, uh, we've all fallen short. We've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we, we look at God's law and it's, you know, uh, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as soon as we hear God's word, we can't help but recognize that we've fallen short. I haven't done that. If we say that we haven't sinned, we're just making God out to be a liar. And then his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. At this point in time, John is the last remaining apostle alive. He is the elder of the church. He is the, you know, the, the wise one, the, the, the one who walked and talked and, and hung out with Jesus and was there for so many of, of Jesus' miracles and messages. And it's no wonder that he looks at the church and as other believers in the church as his children because it's kind of like the gospel has given birth to them. And so he says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This, this relationship of affection, and I get it. I love Word of Life Church. He's writing these things because he doesn't want us to sin, but if anyone does sin, and you will, I do, you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he is advocating for us. That means every single time we're praying in confession, every single time we're praying in, in, in repentance, every single time we're calling out to the Lord and just crying out to him for help, Jesus Christ is sitting at his right hand, whispering into his ear, yep, he's one of yours. That's a child of God. She's a child of God. You are, you are, you are. And he's advocating and saying, yep, I paid for that sin. 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 Advocating with the Father. 
and he is the propitiation. That means that he is the, the offering, the sin offering for our sins. He took each and every one of our sins from us and stuck it to himself. He who knew no sin became sin. And he died in our place, paying the debt of sin. And, and then after he died for those sins, he rose victorious, conquering sin and death for all time, for all of eternity. Not only for ours. He didn't just do that for you. He didn't just do that for me. He did that for all of the sins of the whole world. Yes, Jesus Christ paid for all sins of all people of all time. And that's what he did for us. When we talk about repentance, this is what we're talking about. Turning to God. He's the one who gives us this relationship and that we enter into this fellowship. We walk in the light. And as we, and as we come face to face with, the, uh, with his word, we, it's revealed that we have sinned against him. And yet as we go to the Lord in, in confession, he's faithful and he forgives us. Not because of what we've done, not because we decided to give up, you know, something for Lent. He forgives us because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And in, we enter into this new life. And yeah, we don't want to sin. Nobody wants that. But when we do, we repent. We turn to God to receive forgiveness because Jesus Christ has already paid for it. I was, I was reading, I came across uh, an article by Chad Bird, and, and he said this, On Ash Wednesday, we're being honest with God and with ourselves, and while honesty is praiseworthy, it does nothing to cross the chasm between us and God against whom we have all sinned. We can confess and feel terrible about all our sins all day long, but none of that brings us any closer to the kind of healing that we desperately need. What is really good for the soul is not, much, not so much confession, because we've all heard that saying, you know, confession is good for the soul. He says, if confession is telling us the truth about ourselves to God, then its absolution is God telling us a truer truth about ourselves. Confession says, I have sinned, but absolution says, your sins are no more. This Ash, Ash Wednesday. And I'm, I'm sorry we're not here, you know, to, to apply ashes to, to foreheads and then to celebrate with some lasagna afterwards. But this Ash Wednesday, as you repent, as we all repent and turn to God for forgiveness, as we receive forgiveness because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, hear this. Each and every one of you who is believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, hear this. You are forgiven. You are loved. And you are valued by God. And that's his promise to us. Amen.
for getting together with us on this Ash Wednesday. Um, hopefully, we'll see you on Sunday. Let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before you in humility. We confess to you our faith. We believe in you. We also confess to you our sins, that we have sinned against you. We've sinned against you in our thoughts. We've sinned against you by the things that we say. That we've think, sinned against you in the things that we've done. And we beg you for forgiveness. Not because we're cleaning up our lives or living our best life now. No, we come to you for forgiveness because no matter how hard we try, we still fall short. And as we walk in the light, as, we, as we're walking through life, hearing your word, we cannot help but see we've sinned. And we've messed up. And we confess that to you. Thank you for forgiveness, not because of what we've done, but because of what your son, Jesus Christ, did. And he took all of our sins on himself, paid for them on the cross, and then rose in victory. And we can't wait to celebrate Easter together. But between now and then, we ask you, Lord God, to renew us Remind us over and over again for our need for repentance to continue to turn back to you, God, over and over and over again. There is no sin that is too big. There is no sin that has you know, plagued us for too long. There is no sin outside of what your son has already paid for. And so we ask you, Lord God, to remind us over and again to turn back to you. That's repentance. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for washing us clean with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on our behalf. We believe you. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen.